All right, welcome back to another episode here at Whiteboard Medicine. We appreciate you checking it out. Hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's enjoying. Uh, depend on, I guess it depends on where you live, but the end-ish of summer, transition into fall, all that good stuff. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic near and dear to, I think, many... If I could just take a quick 60 seconds of your time, I wanted to introduce our newest whiteboard medicine emergency and critical care community, and that is our Patreon community. Here we post emergency and critical care medicine medical education topics every other day. We focus on landmark trials, new trials, clinical pearls, bedside tips and tricks, and much more. Everything emergency and critical care. We also upload study guides for each video. We have practice tests. And our newest addition is going to be mini courses that kind of lay out video study guides, practice questions um, into an easily digestible form that we hope is very applicable and helpful to the bedside. Our goal is to try to get even 1% of our YouTube community to join our Patreon community. It would be incredibly helpful in allowing us to spend more time creating content and elevating our current content. We appreciate you all and we hope to see many of you there. Emergency and critical care uh, medicine enthusiasts hearts and that is the IVC or the inferior vena cava assessment on ultrasound. We're going to be talking about what it is. We'll talk about how to measure it. We'll talk about how to calculate it, how to use it clinically in both mechanically ventilated patients and spontaneous breathing patients because it is different. We'll talk about strengths, pitfalls, evidence, practical bedside algorithm, and then we'll get into some practice questions. I think this will hopefully be really kind of clinically useful and uh, useful to the bedside as well. And this is something we use all the time. We probably should have a better understanding of when it works, when it doesn't work, and everything in between. So if you want this study guide, we post all these study guides on our Patreon page. Uh, we really have buffed up that Patreon community over time. So definitely check that out if, if you're interested. We'd love to have you there. No further ado, IVC assessment on ultrasound, starting with what is it? Well, you know, the bedside ultrasound assessment of the IVC diameter and its respiratory variation is something that I think we use clinically a lot to try to estimate the intravascular volume status. You know, number of time on shifts uh, on shift, I hear, oh, the IVC is small, we're giving them fluid, the IVC is big, we're not giving them fluid, what have you. Um, and it's not necessarily that simple, um, but it is something that we use um, and we look at the diameter, the size of the IVC and how much it collapses with respiratory variation. And we use that as a surrogate for the volume status of the patient. If, uh, I don't know if I'll say it, I was going to say if it uh, works, it is really helpful, right? Because this is a simple, fast, non-invasive tool. You can do it over and over again that can complement your clinical judgment and help guide resuscitation. But the IVC at the end of the day really reflects right atrial pressure. And that right atrial pressure is a surrogate for something like venous return, but it is a pressure. It's not, you know, estimating or reflecting cc's of volume in the pipe that is the inferior vena cava. Um, it's really a surrogate for pressure. And when you're using pressure to extrapolate to volume, you can run into issues. And it's important to know that. Um, the collapsibility or distensibility during respiration does give clues about the preload and intravascular filling. So we'll talk about how to measure it, and then we'll talk about how useful it really is. So how do you actually measure it? Well, you should go sub xiphoid or subcostal. So if we draw a human, sorry if you're listening to this, although our drawings are horrible. So it probably is not going to be much helpful if you weren't listening to it anyways. Okay. And you kind of have your ribs here. So you're going to use the subcostal view. It's going to be in this region, this nice triangle here, right? You're going to go kind of right sub xiphoid. If we were to draw the bones, you have your kind of a new brium into your xiphoid. You're going to go right sub xiphoid. And you should use the curvilinear or the phase array probe, phase array also known as the cardiac probe. And you're going to find the IVC as it's entering the right ventricle. So it kind of looks like this, right? You have your liver echo texture, then you have this IVC running beneath the liver, and then usually you can see it emptying into the heart itself. That's what you want to find, all right? And you want to actually measure it two centimeters caudal to the entrance. So you can measure it out on the ultrasound, find two centimeters, and you want to measure it in that vicinity, okay? Measure the IVC in long axis during inspiration and expiration. You can record in an end mode as well and actually quantify the variation, right? End mode is where you get a nice line over here, and end mode records the variation up and down and gives you kind of a tracing, and you can measure that tracing uh, to get a quantitative assessment. You can also just measure it on the screen. 
The key measurements here is you want to measure the IVC max and the IVC min during the expiratory and inspiratory cycle, because that is what's going to drive your size as well as your collapsibility or distensibility. And that gets into these indices. So there's two different ways that we should be doing this. One is the collapsibility index, and one is the distensibility index. And this is a classic mistake. So patients on mechanical ventilation or really any positive pressure ventilation, BiPAP, CPAP, vent, really you should be doing something called the distensibility index. You shouldn't be looking at size and collapsibility. You should be doing the distensibility index. And that's a math equation as much as that annoys us. And that math equation is the IVC max minus the IVC min divided by the IVC min, okay? So let's say the max is 2.0, the min is 1.5, that equals 0.5. Uh oh, I shouldn't have done this, divided by 1.5. Luckily my phone's right by me and I'm taking my calculator out. Don't judge me, I'm sorry. 0.5 divided by 1.5. That's gonna be 0.33 and then you'd multiply it by 100 because it gets a percent and that'll be 33%, okay? Whereas the collapsibility index in someone spontaneously breathing, and in someone spontaneously breathing, you can use size as well as the collapsibility, um, but it's IVC max minus IVC min divided by IVC max. So if you notice the distensibility, you divide it by the IVC min, and the collapsibility, you divide it by the IVC max. And when we talk about how to use this, if we focus on spontaneously breathing patients first where we're using the collapsibility index, you look at the size. If the size is less than 2.1 centimeters, 2.1 centimeters is this magical number, okay? If the size is less than 2.1 centimeters and it's greater than 50% collapsible, the right atrial pressure is probably low, and that suggests probably a relative hypovolemia. And we'll get into why I'm saying probably so much later. Whereas if the IVC is greater than 2.1 centimeters and less than 50% collapsible with respiratory cycling, the right atrial pressure is probably high, and it may suggest volume overload or high right-sided pressures. Lots of caveats to this that we'll talk about. This is different than someone who's mechanically ventilated. In someone mechanically ventilated, you really should be using that distensibility index. And that magic number is 18%, right? So we talked about IVC max minus IVC min divided by IVC max. And if it's greater than 18%, that suggests the patient is fluid responsive. So we, I think, as a you know, larger cohesive specialty of emergency and critical care medicine, um, often treat mechanically ventilated patients the same way we treat spontaneously breathing patients when we're measuring the IVC, and you shouldn't. That's, that's not aligned with how it is best used. In some mechanically ventilated, it is less reliable, um, especially in low tidal volume ventilation, high PEEP or RV dysfunction. So in mechanically ventilated patients in general, it's just not as reliable. So you gotta be really careful. So you should be using the distensibility index in someone mechanically ventilated, but even then, it's still not as reliable as if uh, it is in someone spontaneously breathing. Rules of thumb here. Just like CVP, if you've seen our CVP uh, episodes, which you got a bunch out there, um, rules of thumb here are the extremes are probably meaningful. So a super small, let's say the IVC is 0.8 centimeters and someone's spontaneously breathing, it collapses down to zero centimeters. That patient is probably volume depleted. Whereas if it's 3.4 centimeters and it collapses down to nothing, 3.3 centimeters, that patient is probably volume overloaded. So at the extremes, it's probably fairly helpful as a surrogate for volume status. And that's similar to CVP, okay? But in the gray, the in-between when it's not at the extremes, that's when you're like, gosh, I, I don't know, is this really helpful or not um, in terms of helping me understand the patient's volume status? So the strengths of CVP, or sorry, CVP, IVC assessments are it's non-invasive, it's quick, it's vi widely available, and it's repeatable. You could do it over and over again. You could sit there all day long and do 20 IVC assessments, okay? It's helpful when invasive monitors aren't available, often in the emergency department, um, or even the ICU if you don't have a patient on, you know, have evasive, invasive lines and all that kind of stuff. And it's useful to trend, right? If the IVC is super small, you volume resuscitate that patient. Now the IVC it looks more euvolemic. You've probably caught up to some degree um, in terms of their volume status. The pitfall, those are robust. It's not a good standalone test. 
okay? The correlation with volume status is imperfect, just in general and in studies. Lots of things confound it. Increased intra-abdominal pressure, that's going to be putting pressure on your inferior vena cava, that's going to make it inaccurate, right? Does the patient have ascites? Are they obese? Do they have intra-abdominal hypertension or compartment syndrome? Not accurate. Elevated intrathoracic pressure, same thing, because that IVC travels from the abdominal cavity into the thoracic cavity. So if there's elevated intrathoracic pressures, IVC assessment's also not going to be accurate. So are they on high PEEP? Do they have high airway pressures? Um, all that will make it inaccurate. Do they have right ventricular dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension? If the pressure in that right ventricle from acute right ventricular dysfunction or chronic or tricuspid regurg is high, that's going to make the IVC more plump and plethoric, and it has nothing to do with their volume status necessarily. And if someone has like a robust respiratory effort, they're breathing these huge big breaths, that's going to cause the IVC to not be accurate either. So lots of things can confound this. This is honestly, there's more than this too. Um, so just know that, you know, this is a data point, as we always say, like many data points, and it's why there's emergency resuscitationists and intensivists uh, who focus on this stuff, because there isn't any single measure that's the end-all be-all. So use the IVC assessment within the larger clinical context as a data point um, that is uh, one small data point within the larger um, forest of data points you're collecting. When we look at the evidence in particular, the accuracy of IVC um, variation, it does have moderate predictive value for fluid responsiveness, but it's still less reliable than some of the dynamic indices like pulse pressure variation or passive leg raise. All right. It, the strength is that it's better at ruling out extreme states. Is it very full, right? Plump and plethoric or very empty, tiny and collapsible. That is probably more meaningful in terms of someone who's hypovolemic or hypervolemic. And then, you know, most societies say IVC assessment is a reasonable thing to do as an adjunct, but don't use it as a sole determinant if someone needs fluid or not. So if we think about a practical bedside algorithm, um, I think it'd be reasonable. You have someone, you're not sure their volume status. They don't have a central line. They don't have an A-line. They can't give you a good history. Do an IVC assessment and an echocardiogram, right? If the IVC is incredibly small and collapsible, they're likely volume down. If it's super large and plethoric, they're likely volume up. But put an echo probe on their chest too. Do they have signs of RV dysfunction? Do they have tricuspid regurge, right? All these things are going to affect that still. If you're unsure from the IVC assessment, think about other stuff. Put them on end title and do passive leg raise, right? Put an A-line and do pulse pressure variation. As I said, do an echo, do a lung ultrasound, all that good stuff. One data point and make sure to collect more um, if you don't have an IVC that's kind of at one of the extremes there. All right, quick video. We do have some practice questions coming up. If you have not been part of practice questions on whiteboard medicine before, um, we will read the question, read the answer options, and then we go right into the answer. So if you need more time to think about it, just make sure to pause the episode because we'll go right into the answer. And we usually have three questions, a beginner, an intermediate, and an advanced. So the beginner question, which statement best describes the IVC in a spontaneously breathing patient with hypovolemia? A, dilated IVC with no collapse. B, small IVC with greater than 50% collapse. C, we're getting some numbers now, an IVC that's greater than 2.1 centimeters with a less than 50% collapsibility. Or D, an IVC diameter that's greater than 3 centimeters with non-collapsing. Answer is, pause here if you need to, answer is B, a small IVC with more than 50% collapsibility. So in hypovolemia, less than 2.1 centimeters and greater than 50% collapsible is correlated with someone who might be hypovolemic. All right, next question. A 65-year-old on mechanical ventilation at 8 cc's per kg is hypotensive. Uh -oh. IVC diameter varies from 16 millimeters to 20 millimeters across the cycle. What is the distensibility index and what does it suggest? Let's do some math together. How about that? So IVC diameter is 16 to 20. So it's going to be IVC max is 20 minus IVC min is 16, which equals 4. And it's going to be divided by IVC Oh boy, now we're totally forgetting the equation. Let's go up and re-remember it together. Um, divided by IVC min for the distensibility index. And IVC min here is 16. So 4 divided by 16 is 25%. And remember, anything greater than 18% implies they're probably fluid responsive. Oh, did we do our math wrong? I think we did our math right. I think maybe I put the wrong answer down here. So we're going to go with B, and you are going to correct me if I did my math wrong. All right. Um, 
Advanced question. A 70-year-old septic patient on high PEEP ventilation has a dilated, non-collapsing IVC. Why might this not indicate fluid overload? A. Elevated intra-abdominal pressures may falsely enlarge the IVC. B. Spontaneous inspiratory efforts are overestimating variation. C. Arrhythmia alters venous return. Or D. A small tidal volume challenge exaggerates the IVC diameter. The correct answer is A. So this patient... If they were to have elevated intra-abdominal pressure, that would falsely enlarge the IVC. Same thing with the high PEEP that they're on, right? In general, spontaneous inspiratory efforts um, can overestimate variation, but this is a patient um, who is on mechanical ventilation. Arrhythmias might alter venous return too, but not uh, applicable to this question. And then small tidal volumes don't exaggerate IVC diameter, but high PEEP, high intrathoracic pressure, RV dysfunction, tricuspid regurg, intra-abdominal hypertension, all those things can affect the IVC assessment. So that's all we have for you today. Let's know what thoughts, comments, questions you have down below. Again, we'd love for you to join our Patreon community. We're very active on there. Um, we also have, uh, obviously, our YouTube platform and podcast platform. We'd love to see you on some of those. And either way, uh, stay well, keep learning. We'll see you next time.